Yeah. Hello. Um, I, I think we're going to get started. <clears throat> so we're here to today to celebrate our very own uh, Chital Kalantri's wonderful new book, uh, Women's Human Rights and Migration, Sex Selective Abortion Laws in the United States and India. Um, Chital is a clinical law professor. She's the director of the International Human Rights Policy Advocacy Clinic and co-director of the Migration and Human Rights Program at Cornell. And we have a great uh, group of panelists to engage with the incredibly topical um, issues presented in the book and then um, for uh, Schittel to respond to those comments before we have a general conversation. So our, our three panelists today are Sherry Cole. So Sherry <clears throat> is the professor of law and the Charles Evans Hughes Scholar here at, at Cornell Law School. Her research and teaching interests center on issues of constitutional and criminal procedure, animal rights, sexual equality, and evidence. She's written countless articles. Uh, her most recent book is co-authored with Michael Dorff. It's Beating Hearts, Abortion, and Animal Rights, um, uh, published in 2016 by Columbia University Press. Um, after uh, Sherry, uh, the next person that's going to speak is um, Hila Shamir. Kila is the Vice Dean of Academic Affairs and Associate Professor at Tel Aviv University Faculty of Law. She also uh, was a visiting faculty member here back in 2012. Could it have been that long? So it's wonderful to be able to welcome um, Kila back. Uh, her own research focuses on immigration law, labor law, employment law, welfare, globalization law, and social theory. And she's written um, countless articles, including um, a number of pieces on questions of anti-trafficking and regulating sex work, as well as unionizing uh, subcontracted labor. <clears throat> and then <clears throat> our uh, uh, next speaker is uh, Sonia Katyal. Um, Sonia Katyal is the Chancellor's Professor of Law and co-director of the Berkeley Center for Law and Technology um, at uh, Bolt Law School at the University of California, Berkeley. Um, her work focuses on intellectual property, art law, civil rights, property theory, and technology new media. She's also the co author of numerous articles, as well as the co-author of the book Property Outlaws from Yale University Press in 2010, um, co-written with our very own Eduardo Penalver. So it's wonderful to have all three speakers here today. We'll begin uh, with Professor Colt. So first, I want to thank Professor Kalantri for writing this fascinating and important book. Um, I'm also delighted to hear from our other guests today. Is this working? Yeah. Yes. Some, OK. Um, so we tend to get caught up in one of two ways of thinking when it comes to cultural practices that seem oppressive to us. One way is that we simply defer to the foreign culture. We, um, embrace cultural relativism and we conclude that whatever that culture considers to be legitimate is okay um, and we don't judge it because it's somebody else's culture. The second way we tend to get caught up in is the opposite approach which is to judge the practice in a uniform way and to think that if something is discriminatory or otherwise objectionable in its country of origin then it must therefore be discriminatory or objectionable here as well. Kalantri gives us a way out of this split. She observes that a practice may look the same in its country of origin and here, but looks can be deceptive. And so what is oppressive in one country may not be in another. And this is not cultural relativism because She's arguing that an apparently similar practice actually can be different when it's taken out of its place of origin and transplanted into another place like into the United States. And this is an approach which Kalantri calls um, transnational legal feminism. And it stays true to feminism while encouraging us to cultivate a humility about what we're seeing and not to assume that what we're seeing is what we imagine that we're seeing. Um, when immigrants move and transport some of their customs here, things can change. Um, this approach is in some ways a mirror image of cultural relativism because cultural relativism takes an objectionable practice 
that happens in its place of origin and defers to the culture there. Kalantri, rather than deferring to it, she'll be critical of it in its place of origin. But she's willing to entertain the possibility that the same practice might be benign when it's moved somewhere else. So she is sensitive to the fact and wants to know about the practice on the ground in both places, rather than just thinking about the practice in the abstract. Um, and she usefully notes, she usefully notes, that when a practice becomes one of a minority group of the population, a minority of the population, and when it's motivated by something different, its consequences and thus its normative status may change as well. So to unveil her transnational feminist legal theory approach, Kalantri focuses on sex selection abortion and on bans on this practice. And I think this is really an excellent choice because we know that sex selection abortion happens in India and in China. And we see that various states in the United States have begun to ban, well have been for a while, but have continued to ban sex selection abortion here. And apparently motivated in part by Asian immigrants' presence and the belief that they have transplanted this practice from their countries of origin. Klantry shows us through her own and through others' research that sex selection, when it comes here, is very different from when it takes place in Asia. In Asia, when women self sex select, uh, not self select, that would, that would be problematic, um, <laughs> self selection abort, but when they sex select, they tend to do it in favor of boys, mainly because of societal discrimination against uh, girls. And as a result, sex selection abortion produces a male skew in the demographics in these countries. Um, and that can have very negative effects for women when the population is overwhelmingly male. That can go with predatory behavior and abuse. In the United States, by contrast, when people, including Asian immigrants, self again self-select, sex select, they tend to do it in favor of gender balance within the family. So if they have girls, they might select against a girl. If they have boys already, they might, sell, they might select against a boy. Um, so both the motive for and the consequence of the practice in the US is different. The motive is not to eliminate girls, but to have largely a mix of sexes in the family, which is a more benign wish. And the consequences are negligible, both because people um, from other countries are Asian immigrants are a minority of the population, and because this practice doesn't systematically skew toward eliminating females. Because her approach is feminist, Kalantri asks in each place where self, self, sex, I can't seem to say the word sex, um, sex selection abortion <laughs> takes place, um, that what, she asks, what is the impact of the practice and of banning the practice. In India, for example, it's illegal to tell women the sex of their fetus. And this is a measure against this kind of abortion. Kalantri concludes that such a measure may be warranted. Although it limits women's reproductive options and it denies them information about their bodies, it does so to protect, the greater, protect against the greater harm of a male skewed population where there's more violence against women. In the United States, by contrast, where sex selection is what you might call rare and balanced, um, it does not have much impact on women as a group. So bans are harmful to women and they have nothing going for them. They j it just limits their, their reproductive options. It chills doctors from performing abortions for Asian patients even when they're not sex selecting because doctors are profiling their patients and don't want to get into legal trouble. Kalantri therefore comes down firmly against the bans in the United States. As someone who thinks a lot about abortion, not just sex selection abortion, I'm especially grateful to Kalantri for delving into this topic. The book really helped me think about different frames into which one can think about the decision to terminate a pregnancy. First, Klantry discusses the stereotypes that people have of women abroad whose boyfriends or husbands force them to abort because they are carrying a girl. This brings to mind a first frame for abortion, which is that it is an act by a man against a woman. 
Then Kalantri explains the reality of how the decision is made. In China or in India, the decision likely results from a perception of how girls are treated by society. So in the second frame, abortion is an act by society against a woman, as it motivates her by discriminating against her. A third frame, of course, is one in which it's an act by a woman against her fetus. This is the original pro-life frame although the pro-life movement seems to have adopted the first frame as well, that women are victims of abortion coerced by men. And yet another fourth frame appears if you think of abortion as an assertion of bodily integrity, and then it is a, sort of an act by a fetus, however innocent, against a woman that motivates the abortion. With the transnational feminist legal approach, Kalantri implicitly takes the fourth frame seriously. The frame of abortion as centering on what the fetus does to the woman. She thinks of abortion as a reproductive right for all women. She complicates the assumption of the first frame, that it's an act of a man against a woman, by introducing the second frame, the, um, the society against a woman frame, where making the choice to abort females is understandable as a reaction to societal attitudes, even if it's ultimately too harmful to be tolerated. The one frame Kalantri does not engage is the third, the frame in which an abortion is an act by a woman against her fetus. Indeed, she highlights her view of the fetus in two ways. First, she talks about the fetus's sex in various places as its future sex, implying that the fetus does not yet have a sex but will one, have one in the future. Second, she says approvingly that the fetus lacks any right against discrimination because such a right would imply personhood. Though I am pro-choice, I want to question the decision to disregard the third frame, that of the woman acting against the fetus. I found the idea of a fetus's future sex somewhat jarring because it seemed to deny that the fetus has a real existence. Even if one believes in the abortion right, one must acknowledge that a fetus exists prior to birth and has characteristics that designate sex, even though it may not have a gender yet, which is also true for a newborn baby. So I'd like to know whether Kalantri considers the fetus worthy of moral consideration at any point in pregnancy. Um, at various point, places, she says um, that even though self, sex selection abortion should not be banned in the US, she says she doesn't approve of the practice and doesn't believe it's right. So my question is, if the fetus is not worthy of protection against discrimination, at any point during gestation, then why is it, what bothers Kalantri about sex selection in the US? Um, since it's not motivated by antipathy to girls, and it's not likely to have demographic consequences. Um, so why does she disapprove of it? Um, OK. Another interesting thing I learned from Kalantri's book is the complicated relationship between disparate treatment and disparate impact in discrimination. Under Title VII of the Civil Rights Act, employers are not allowed to discriminate in hiring and other conditions of employment on the basis of race, sex, and other categories. And as the law has developed, there are two types of discrimination. There's desperate treatment, which is intentional discrimination, and then there's disparate impact, where there may not be any intent, but the impact of whatever it is, like a, like a job test or a promotion test, is to have it um, to, to treat people differently, to have a different outcome for members of different groups. And in the law, disparate treatment is typically considered worse. Um, that is when the differential outcomes are intentional. Uh, while disparate treatment is almost never allowed, disparate impact may be justified, for example, if a test is job related and consistent with business necessity. Um, and it seems logical to treat disparate treatment worse than impact because in the former case, you have a bad actor who is intentionally um, harming somebody. Um, in the second, you just have a disproportionate effect of a possibly well-meaning practice. But Kalantri shows how impact might be more important than treatment. In the context of sex selection abortion, um, the practice involves different differential treatment or disparate treatment, whether it's in China, India, or the United States. Somebody is deciding to have an abortion on the basis of the sex of their <coughs> child. But it is disparate impact, its effect on the population that actually matters. That's the, the impact on the population determines whether it's appropriate to regulate or not. In India, it is appropriate to regulate because of the impact on the population. In the US, it's not. 
In other words, there is disparate treatment in all cases, but the woman who uh, the woman who sex selects intentionally discriminates, but in the U.S., no, there's no disparate impact, so the um, so the regulation is inappropriate. This is a very useful lesson because our law simply does not take impact seriously enough. Not only is disparate impact potentially excusable in employment discrimination law, it carries no weight at all in constitutional equal protection jurisprudence, except as evidence of intentional discrimination. This means that you can show that a government gives out a benefit almost exclusively to white people, and that's not going to affect its constitutionality if no one intended that result, even when the results are terrible. Kalantri teaches us to pay close attention to the effects of people's actions, because sometimes effects are more important than intentions. And it's easy to forget that if we look exclusively to our law as a guide. So thank you, Professor Kalantri. You have educated me and all others who read your book about the complexity of practices to which we might have a knee-jerk negative reaction. Though you do not like se sex selection abortion, and I'll be interested in hearing why, you take empirically supported look at, uh, an empirically supported look at the practice. And you do the same for another practice, veiling, that I hope others will touch on. I haven't talked about that. Um, you draw sophisticated conclusions about the proper place for regulation. Your approach to evaluating cross-border practices, the transnational feminist legal approach, deserves to be studied and deployed as we encounter more and more transplanted customs whose migration may have changed their deep meaning and therefore their normative status as well. Uh, thanks so much. It's a, it's a great pleasure to be here, and it's a real honor to be here to celebrate um, uh, Professor Kalantri's book. Um, so not only is uh, her book a tremendous descriptive contribution to the very important issue of international reproductive rights and justice, but it also provides us with um, a very useful snapshot of the limitations, I think, of Western feminism when displaced or perhaps misplaced onto the lives and experiences of people, and particularly women in the global south. And the book, I think, makes a substantial contribution to a whole variety of areas, um, women's rights, globalization and migration studies, Asian American history, law, and also importantly, the area of public health. Many of us here uh, know the feeling all too well of having spent time in South Asia or a part of some non-Western country and the United States, uh, also in the United States, struggling over the way in which culture becomes reinterpreted through Western lenses as a sort of kind of uncovering of exploitation. And all too often, as she reminds us, the issue is much more complicated than the picture and the media or perhaps Congress has offered us. And real and compelling change is really about reckoning with the limitations of, of context. And I think it would be easy to say, as many of us have done, that um, there's perspectives from the West and then there are perspectives from elsewhere and very often the two never meet or that they're at a crossroads. But I think this also, this perception sheds light on what the real gift of Kalantri's work does and that is her novel methodology of context. So she offers us an incredibly useful case study about how a current debate, when explored and analyzed within both a critical and empirical lens, can reveal some of the shortcomings of traditional narratives that surround women's rights. And what she sheds light on, frankly, is tremendously eye-opening. So from her description of how she discovered through patient investigation that so much of the advocacy surrounding the film It's a Girl, which was um, surrounded by um, sex-specific abortion advocates, was actually bankrolled by anti-abortion forces, to her chilling observation that, quote, had the director's resources not been so cleverly hidden, then perhaps the American feminist community would have been more skeptical about the claims the director was making regarding India and China. But the problem here, as she points out, is that the narrative of disempowered South Asian women compared to Western activists who claim that they, quote, help South Asian women who cannot help themselves, as Kalantri points out, is actually a story about a filter bubble, 
As we know from all the reports about fake news and cognitive science, we actually tend to seek out information that confirms our own implicit biases. And so when a film gets produced that suggests a familiar, familiar narrative of the oppressed South Asian woman and the empowered, liberatory Western activist, it actually tends to fit within a narrative, narrative that is often offered to us. And so here, what we miss is the real danger behind the narratives that are offered to us. Like the fake news stories of today, we miss the fact that the movement to, res to restrict sex-specific abortions is being bankrolled and facilitated by a larger movement that is invested in narrowing a woman's right to choose. So just making this factual connection alone between the so-called left, the so-called right, right, um, and the kind of narratives that combine them both right, would be a tremendous contribution in terms of rethinking these kinds of narratives. But Kalantri does so much more than just that. And in doing so, she opens up an opportunity for a profound conversation between South Asian feminists and Western feminists. And normally, this story might sort of lead us to think that there might not be room for dialogue, but this is exactly where her book becomes so important and so essential, because it's actually not a story about an impasse. It's actually a story about how a singular methodology and commitment, that is a commitment to context, can actually help us to constructively navigate other kinds of issues in the future. And so Kalantri's novel contribution here is to force us to grapple with the limitations of the approaches that are in front of us today, to push us beyond our filter bubbles and to reckon with the messiness of context. And the brilliance behind this model is that she offers us a story that actually spans empirical research, theoretical modeling, economics, culture, and she grounds this within a framework that is both anecdotal and focuses on the real life narratives faced by women in South Asia and elsewhere to shed light on the issue of sex specific abortions. And so for me, there's a couple themes that I just wanna emphasize briefly as kind of core contributions behind this book. And the first I think is her willingness to explore and really delve deeply into the data surrounding the practice. So she mines the literature to find a paper, an influential paper from 2008 that was incredibly highly influential in this debate. And she thoroughly disbunks this paper in favor of a more context specific approach. And the virtue here of her work is that Kalantri doesn't shy away from empirical research and economic thought, but she brings to this area a deeply critical understanding from the lens of critical race theory and other lenses where she unpacks these core issues, um, deconstructing the kind of familiar narratives that are so seductive to us in navigating the issues facing South Asian women. And so with this critical lens, she encourages us to think beyond the data and to think constructively about an alternative framework. So she shows us, for example, that the data in the United States reveals that it's not actually the case that Asian Americans have a strong preference for sons. And even more importantly, she interrogates the reasons for why Asian American organizations in the United States tend not to spend their resources countering this presumption. And she shows us that much of this is actually due to a similar kind of decontextualization from the actual lives and experiences of Asians living in the United States. And it is in some ways the migration of presumptions that kind of underscores Kalantri's, of concern, Kalantri's concern because it often provides the backdrop that justifies the need for a deeper exploration of the practice in the United States and how it could continue to be regulated. So here, Kalantri valuably points out an irony that an appreciable number of the elected representatives that voted to ban sex-specific abortions were also known to be solidly pro-choice. And she shows us that pro-life advocates knowingly exploited, exploited familiar narratives about women in Asian countries, arguing that the need to ban sex-specific abortions was because of the anti-woman culture in Asia. But by looking at the data, Kalantri shows us that the sex ratios in India and China are vastly different than the sex ratios among Indian and Chinese American groups in the US. It's either identical to US born Caucasians or it actually skews female. And this brings me to the, great, to the second great contribution of this book. So Kalantri offers us an 
alternative methodological lens with which to explore cross-cultural social issues like sex-specific abortions. And so I think that this is also one of the central reasons for why this book is going to make such a tremendous contribution to the field because of the constructive methodology, methodologically, methodology that she brings, um, which helps us to analyze specific issues that affect women in both the North and the Global South. Much of the related work in print appears to be either sort of a purely analytical critique or it is more of a descriptive treatment of the problem that affects uh, women without kind of a concurrent methodological solution. But because she offers us such a rich empirical and analytical critique, and also because she offers us a constructive methodological lens, I believe that this tool is an essential, essential tool for transnational feminism. So while other books might offer similar critiques about how the law treats women differently in different contexts, Calantri actually offers us a case study about how an alternative approach that focuses primarily on building context can actually yield different policy prescriptions. So drawing from insights gleaned from the empirical data and an interrogation of the myths that surround sex-specific abortions, she argues for a woman-centered approach that asks whether the practice is truly widespread and whether it carries negative consequences for women and girls in that society. And so she importantly situates these bans in the United States as demonstrative of an overall trend towards reducing a woman's reproductive freedom, not as a function of increased equality for women. And this resituation of the issue and the data carries enormous consequences for proponents of these bans, placing them within a spectrum of attempts to limit a woman's right to choose rather than an effort to, motivated towards anti-subordination. And so what does she mean essentially by capturing the importance of context? Well here she carves out a space that is largely between two poles. That of the notion that universal human rights are always universal and that of the notion that they are culturally relativistic. And the brilliance behind this contextual approach I think is its active link to patterns of migration which ground her theory in the realities of globalization and the flow and patterns of capital. And she argues that sometimes those in migrant receiving countries automatically assume that immigrants will undertake similar practices as people from their country of origin, thus overemphasizing the role of culture. But her prescriptions, I think, rely on unpacking those presumptions, showing us how they are dangerously reductive of the experiences of immigrant formations. And this brings me to the third significant contribution made by the book, and that is its recurring theme of migration. And I mean migration in the broadest sense, migration of peoples, migration of presumptions, a migration of data, and a migration more normatively of a transnational feminist approach to a broader array of issues. So in some ways, her chapter on the French ban on full face veils actually showcases how pragmatic and useful her context-based model can be in the face of countless issues that surround women and female autonomy. So she points out in this debate that the lack of input from women who actually wore the full face veil was sorely lacking and contributed to the further decontextualization of the issue. And she points out that actually within a whole parliamentary inquiry, there was only one woman that appeared before parliament to talk about her experiences in full, fa in full face veil, and that was at the woman's own request. So, Again, as in, in the abortion issue, the coercion narrative appears seductively simplistic, suggesting that a ban advanced women's equality and that Muslim women essentially lacked the agency to determine the issue for themselves. But as Kalantri notes, at a contextual approach would recognize that in some contexts, a veil ban might promote equality, and in others, it might not. But the task is to be thoughtful and rigorous about recognizing when ideas or presumptions migrate across borders. The idealistic universalism of human rights, so compelling, right, can also be so deeply decontextual. And policymakers have to be thoughtful about the limitations and possibilities behind universalizing these principles to every group. So in the end, Kalantri's work leads us to a difficult question. How does one account for the broad themes of democracy and citizenship in her case studies. So much of the story that she tells us is also a story about the failures of democracy to ensure anti-subordination. 
but it is also a story about the failure of information and the risks of information asymmetry. How can women become and be full-fledged citizens in migrant-receiving countries if they are governed by narratives that they cannot challenge successfully because they play on long-standing presumptions about the superiority of the West? And relatedly, how can we build stronger narratives that connect context to reality? How can we build democracy, including all voices, when both pro and anti-abortion forces unify under a singular umbrella of decontextualization? And so I hope that in future work, others build on the important strides that this book makes and that, and that others ask similar questions about how to recontextualize themes of democracy and citizenship so that they reach the very communities that are often in a world of filter bubbles and simplistic narratives treated unequally. And so in closing, it is my hope that Kalantri's book can reside along the foundational accounts that are offered by scholars like Saba Mahmood, Letty Vope, and Chandra Mahanti, enforcing us to ask these central questions and to move beyond the polarities of universality and relativism. And by doing so, we can move into a more careful, contextual, situational place, which by all accounts may be messier and more complex, but ultimately much more meaningful in ensuring women as citizens and as capable agents in a democracy that is supposed to support them. And this redesign of democracy and of citizenship is central, and this book helps us all to see a pathway to the future. So thank you, Sheetal Kalantri, for giving us this gift, this gift of context and of methodology. And I look forward to watching this book migrate into many of the issues um, surrounding women's equality in the future. Hi. Um, so I'm very happy to be here today to celebrate Chital Kalantri's important and uh, um, important and challenging book and the contribution it brings to feminist legal thought in particular and to the challenges pluralist societies face today in general. Kalantri's book is an immensely important intervention in feminist theory, social change literature, and reproductive rights literature. The book offers a new framework to analyze and assess what is one of the deepest challenges and most controversial policy fields in feminist activism and jurisprudence. How to approach social, religious, cultural, and other practices that migrants bring with them from their country of origin, now that they have been transplanted in a new soil upon migration. The book, as I see it, has two main contributions. The first lies in its careful and thoughtful treatment of what seems like a consensus around a certain type of abortion restriction in the US. Kalantri painstakingly shows the layers of misinformation, ignorance, and misunderstandings that constituted a social reform movement that swept and sweeps the US. Kalantri does so through careful empirical research of the situation in the US and in India, and sensitive analysis of women's motives and societal and economic conditions in both contexts combined with a very sophisticated theoretical call for a context-based transnational feminist legal approach. The book's second contribution is its complex and innovative engagement with feminist legal theory in an attempt to provide feminists with finer tools to approach the question of the regulation of what might appear to be patriarchal practices when practiced by migrants in receiving countries. Well, the book's main case study is the issue of sex selection abortion bans. In my comments today, I will focus on the methodological breakthrough it offers to feminist legal thought more broadly and point to some future directions this research can lead us uh, in this field. So what I want to focus on are three, uh, um, three main issues related to the methodology that Kalantri develops. So one is a question of universalism versus cultural relativism. The second is an issue of deontological argumentation versus cons consequentialist argumentation. And the third is the role of feminist organizations and actors in developing policy in this controversial field. So let me begin with universalism versus cultural relativism. So Kalantri seeks to find a third way between universalism and cultural relativism in feminist approaches to gender-specific practices practiced by migrants. Under her methodology, suggesting that something is always a violation of human rights is irresponsible. We need to check and see how it works in different contexts to understand it properly and regulate it correctly. 
Calandri is clearly reluctant to see herself as a cultural relativist. She resolutely says she's not. But universal claims are suspect under the framework she offers as well. Her rejection of and suspicion towards the universalist claims that undergird much of human rights legal discourse and much of feminist jurisprudence around women's rights seems to stem from her critical race approach. As Sam Moyne has shown so convincingly, in the, so convincingly in his book, The Last Utopia, the human rights discourse, far from being truly universal, is deeply rooted in the attempt of uh, the powerful West to find new ways to assert its values and priorities in a post-colonial world. Calandri's rejection of cultural relativism, on the other hand, seems to stem from her feminist commitment to some baseline of women's rights that feminists would aspire to, regardless of context. Sital is resistant to say that there should be a different standard of equality or of human dignity to women in the globe. There should, there, should there should not be a different standard of equality or human dignity to women in the global south as compared to women in the global north. Her nuanced position reveals a tension between the critical race theorist that rejects universalist claims and the feminist theorist that rejects cultural relativism. The call for a third way, I think, is very, very compelling. Indeed, Calandri seeks to offer, and I quote, a narrow road between these two broad paths. She proposes to find this path by first narrowly and accurately framing the question as it relates to migrant communities and defining carefully what is really at stake. And second, through utilizing the context-based transitional feminist methodology she develops. First, let's begin with the framing. So Calandri is careful to limit her argument to customs that travel, that is cross-border cross customs. She says, and I'm quoting again, I'm asking whether a practice that is considered to be oppressive in one country context should be automatically deemed oppressive in another country context. For example, she does not ask whether the veil is oppressive in Iran per se, but rather whether it's, it's oppressive in Belgium, where it has not been traditionally worn and is worn by a relatively few number of women. The narrow framing of the dilemma is supposed to make the question Calantri deals with clearer and create room for a third way between universalist claims on the one hand and cultural relativism on the other. We're therefore not wondering about cultural practices that may be oppressive for women in general. We inquire about them here only when border crossing may have changed their meaning. But I would like to argue that this humble framing of the question does not do justice to the applicability of the proposed methodology and its potential contribution. I think the framework she developed is much more ambitious and can be useful in a variety of contexts, including those that do not involve migration at all. First of all, Calandri's methodology requires evaluating the practice in the country of origin. The story there is important for us in order to understand the customs meaning in the migrant receiving country. So we end up being very interested in what the veil means in Iran and what, uh, sex, uh, selection what sex selection means in India. Um, assessment of their practices in the country of origin is part of the methodology and we find ourselves having effective tools to do so th thanks to the methodology she develops. Second, this framing appears to me to have kind of a dark side. It seemingly translates into a narrow focus on minority rights when in fact the framing of minority culture might not provide us the solution we wanted between uh, the two extremes. Let me explain. So when Muslims are the, mi the majority, the veil carries a different meaning than when they're a minority, explains Kalantri. Restricting the rights of, minor of a minority while at the same time entrenching stereotypes <coughs> sorry, about the minority should make the restrictions put on a practice in the migrant receiving country suspect, not only because of their minority status, but also because women there operate in a much less patriarchal environment. That's at least the argument. And I'm a bit concerned that the result of this framing of the analysis when we focus it only on migratory context could have a systematic bias. And it ends up that when practiced in the developing world, these suspect practices are deemed to be generally oppressive due to a generally less wealthy environment um, and more patriarchal background culture and society they're part of. But when the same practices are practiced in the developed world, they're not because there the society is perhaps less patriarchal, and generally more wealthy, and therefore women's choices seem to be freer and seemingly less coercive practices, are much, and seemingly coercive practices are much less so. So now we might say this is not necessarily the case. It ends up being the case in these two, in these two case studies in relation 
uh, to the example of sex selection and the fail. But since the method is contextual analysis, perhaps we can imagine a practice that is fine when practiced in the developing world, but bad for women when practiced in the developed world. I tried and tried, and I could only come up with practices that might be perceived as bad in both countries, but not this flip situation. So more maybe female genital mutilation, polygamy, uh, but I couldn't come up with one that will be fine in the developing world and bad in the developed world. So this ends up somewhat closer to cultural relativism. Um, but I would like to suggest that if we widen our inquiry to look at a variety of contexts beyond migration, I think this pattern of normative assessment actually changes. And I think that if we take Kalantri's methodology and apply it to various practices that cause specific gendered harms, regardless of whether um, these practices are transplants or not, we can find it useful in developing effective policy in many other instances as well. I would like to argue, therefore, that this proximity to cultural relativism can be avoided if the question is reframed. If we consider that the question is not whether we should have a one-size-fit-all universal solution in all countries or a free-for-all, each culture to its own relativist view, but instead call for a context-based reform proposal in general. So this will mean that we can all agree that veiling, sex selection, high heels, breast enhancement surgery, female genital mutilation, all have some problematic aspects from a feminist gender equality perspective, but the question of what to do about each one will vary from one context to another. So let's take the example of female genital mutilation. Even if we think FGM is in essence a patriarchal practice, as many feminists do, we might still think that the way to combat it is not to ban it because a ban might leave women even more vulnerable to unsanitary dangerous procedures, as well as stigmatize a wider set of cultural practices, practices and values of the community that practices it. Now, feminists might think, as some critical race feminists do, that uh, it is therefore better to work against it in ways that do not involve bans in criminal law, and maybe not law at all but rather seek other ways, bringing about grassroots community change. Now, this assessment may be different in different countries, according to the background rules of the country, the prevailing customs, and the rule of law in these countries. Another example that will remove us from the uncomfortable zone of cultural relativism can be domestic violence. Nobody argues that domestic violence is not problematic from a gender perspective. However, there's a lively discussion among feminists in the US and elsewhere whether the feminist reform of no-drop policies, longer incarceration periods for violent spouses, are the appropriate tools to deal with it. This is not a cross-border practice, but using Kalantri's contextual distributive analysis here may lead us to the position that many critical voices in the field are currently expressing. Looking at debates within the feminist DV movement in the US, we can find critical voices, especially coming from critical race theorists and activists, who argue that the carceral response to DV has been harmful to women of color and that their needs and voices have been marginalized within the DV movement. They argue that the carceral response and related prosecutorial policies do not assist women of color, but instead lead to greater harm to victims of domestic violence, their children and their communities, by ignoring their economic vulnerability and then the racial bias that state actors of state actors towards uh, African-American men and other minority men. So the question then is not whether DV should or shouldn't be on a feminist agenda. It clearly should. But what will be the best legal way to deal with it given intersectional concerns in a given context? How will we know the answer? We should do exactly what Kalantri suggests in our transnational feminist approach. Even though the context is not transnational, we should conduct a close contextual analysis of the kind Kalantri uses and, develop, and develops in the book to assess the consequences of a given policy adopted to combat DV. By framing the question not as which practices are really harmful to women, but by focusing on what to do about harmful practices, we can move to a discussion that calls for, um, for, for all responsible feminist reform proposal, whether in relation to cross-border practices or not, to employ a contextual distributive approach. By moving from assessment of the essence of the practice to assessment of policies available to deal with it, we can avoid the uncomfortable outcome of cultural relativism on the one hand and universalism on the other. And I said I'm really short, running very short on time, right? I still have a few minutes. Okay. So I'll go to the second point, but I might not do the third. So, second point. <laughs> 
deontological versus consequentialist arguments in how to conduct a cost-benefit analysis. So Calantri offers a methodology that seems to hinge on a theoretical distinction between deontological and consequentialist reasoning. For those who perceive laws representing deontological, deontological morality that should not be uh, concerned with outcomes, but rather with adherence to abstract rules, uh, the entirety of the consequentialist instrument, instrumentalist argument will be irrelevant to their prescriptive impulse. The law should forbid, ban, or criminalize immoral behavior. It can be selling sex, it can be aborting fetuses, it can be selecting the sex of the fetus, it can be restricting women's liberties. Um, and this is all regardless of the actual life outcomes of such prohibitions. Calandra is clearly a sophisticated realist consequentialist who is interested not in abstract morality, but in real life outcomes. This is part of her critical mode. Deontological arguments risk essentializing human beings. However, within feminism, many feminists have a strong deontological impulse. In a book I'm co-authoring about governance feminism, we trace a tendency within some feminist positions to gravitate towards the law's most violent mode, criminal law, as a tool to protect women from gendered harms. When seeking the symbolic and expressive role of the law in a given context, such actors think that, uh, for example, if there is uh, no criminal ban on a given behavior, then this means there is a social permission for it. If there is no ban on sex selection, that means society accepts the unacceptable. They therefore seek to a ban for its symbolic and expressive message that, fe that females' lives matter. In order to at least partially engage this position, this deontological feminist in the conversation, I suggest that the distributive contextual analysis Calandric puts forward can take on symbolic harm caused by, for example, not using legal tools to ban, criminalize, abolish the harmful behavior. The symbolic tolerance of the state to a practice can be counted as a cost. Um, um, that is part of the analysis. But of course, this brings us to the question that a consequentialist has to answer. How do we tally the costs and benefits in such an analysis? How much weight should be given to the expressive costs? How much weight should it carry? Um, and now, I'll, I'll end with some thoughts about this. So let me show the difficulty with an example from the book. So in chapter six, when assessing sex-selective abortion bans in India, Kalantri looks at the harm caused by skewed sex ratios in India. So she finds that some women benefit from skewed sex ratios because of reduced dowries, um, inheritance, access to education and land ownership, but others are harmed due to increased violence, forced marriages, sex trafficking, by the same skewed sex ratio. So what does this tell us about the tools we should use to address the skewed sex ratio? Kalantri does not quite say. This, is part, this part of the chapter ends with a general deferral to the Indian policymaker. Um, but while Kalantri's position that it's not her role to evaluate the costs and benefits is totally understandable, it still remains unclear how should the Indian policymaker or Indian feminist evaluate these costs and benefits, and whether at the end of the day we're not left to decide according to preconceived notions of the role and relative power of men and women, or the role of the state, or other normative commitments regardless of context. If that is the case, um, how do we get the value of the analysis that is so valuable? This challenging aspect of the contextual analysis is apparent earlier on as well when thinking about the harms to individual women versus uh, to the, the, the collective. Um, now clearly, um, the, 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 these issues cannot be answered in a way that will satisfy the normative appetite of each reader. But the reader is left curious about the ideological moves required and the normative preferences that need to be brought to the forefront as well as to the limits of such an analysis. Um, can we tally the cost and benefit without normative priors? And, and the answer is no, and should be no. Our normative commitments are crucial to any policy making. And Kalandri therefore rightly rejects the call to make a decision for the Indian policy maker. It should be according to the, the, the normative um, commitments there. But I think the value of the contextual analysis is its requirement for transparency in relation to the expected costs of a given policy. It's therefore crucial to admit openly that normative priors are required to make a decision following the contextual analysis. And along the way, confront the fact that even among feminists, we can disagree about the outcomes if they, for example, focus on the interests of different groups of women, um, if, uh, if between feminists we focus on the interests of different groups of women or give more weight to the symbolic over the the material.
So one way to go about this is not to offer a clear solution, but rather to think of a way about, uh, to think of how to start thinking about tallying the costs and the benefits. For example, we can try and find out whether there are consistent winners and losers among different groups of women. We can attempt to create a clear normative position about priorities among these costs and benefits, or think about the long-term versus the short-term effects. Some guidelines here could be extremely helpful for the methodology to serve as an arena for productive conversation about policy option. As part of making the policy conversation closer to the facts, informed and transparent, it seems central to the practice of contextual consequentialist analysis to understand how law operates when it meets um, certain social uh, practices. Um, Sorry, uh, for this, um, so for, uh, and this is a final thought, for this stage of the analysis, uh, the analysis of Mnuchin and Kornhauser's classic bargaining in the shadow of the law is, is a good starting point. This analysis starts by identifying, identifying not the injury, not the violence, the discrimination or the, or the harm in a given setting, setting, but the surplus it generates. What gain in human welfare, quantifiable like profits or non-quantifiable like pleasure or prestige, does a given practice produce? Now, Calandri does just that when she reveals the role of the dowry, of old age care, and concern for the future of girls as reasons for preferring sons over daughters in India. The analysis convincingly identifies the surplus that explains why this practice persists and why women continue practicing it even without coercion. So this brings us to, uh, to, to the Indian prohibition on sex determination and to ask the question that the book raises, why uh, didn't it, why the ban that exists in India did not work. And I think um, the lessons here for social movements that, that, that fought so hard for this ban are, 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 are endlessly important. If the prohibition does not affect the surplus from sex selection, then this outcome, the, the outcome that it didn't affect um, uh, sex ratios is not surprising. Perhaps then the feminist struggle around sex selection should be directed elsewhere. And I think this question is part of the uh, research agenda opened up by Kalantri's method, which gives us both the right questions and the right tools um, to answering them. Thank you. Um. Thank you, everybody. Uh, thank you to the panelists, Professor Shamir Katyal Kolb. You really have um, uh, oversold the book, and um, I appreciate the, 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 the kind and, and some critical comments as well. Uh, and I want to thank Professor Rana for bringing us all together. Um, there's so many people here, Eduardo Peñalver for his eternal support, and this book really gains a lot from the scholarly work, not only of these panelists, but also many colleagues um, in the room and not in the room, professors Thomas, Riles, Bowman, Eisenstein, and I'm so grateful for the people who commented on prior drafts and advised me through this publication process, which I couldn't have uh, made it through without. And I have research assistant John Reddy to thank here, who was invaluable um, to the work. So what I'll do is I'll respond to the, 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 some of the comments uh, as I just maybe thought I can trace through the legislative activity um, and the empirical work that we did to uncover it, give a little bit of the the, the story about sex selection in the US. Um, what surprises people the most when I talk about this project is that it's illegal in 10 American states for a woman to terminate her pregnancy if the motive relates to the predictive biological sex of the fetus. And then in the last five years, over half of state legislatures have considered these bans. So as, as one of the panelists mentioned, the firestorm began almost immediately after an article was published in 2008 by two economics professors in a preeminent multidisciplinary journals. The authors compared the ratio of boys to girls born to Asian Americans and Caucasian Americans at each birth parity. And um, they found, and this is what they claimed, uh, 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 they found that the ratios at each birth parity is particularly um, at the second birth parity when the um, Asian American sh uh, families had girls that it was much more uh, male biased at the second and third. 
The authors interpreted these findings to suggest, quote, the magnitude of the deviations for second and third children of Chinese, Indian, and Korean families is comparable to that documented for India, China, and South Korea. That is wrong. Though it's wrong, that sentence found its way in numerous media stories, both fake and real media. Whatever you consider fake and real to be, it was there. Um, carried stories suggesting there's a sex selection crisis in the United States. And although the e economists never reported the number from, from a simple calculation, we can determine that they found that there were about 2,500 quote unquote missing Asian American girls. And by way of comparison, just in India, people say there are about 60 million quote unquote missing girls. I worked with economists to examine this new demographic data because a l much of the work that I read and saw itself um, had a confirmation bias problem, uh, you know, was, was, was built to around supporting existing narratives rather than challenging existing narratives. Um, we examined newer data from the American Community Survey from 2008 and 12 and found something no other prior study had found, which is that a fraction of Asian Americans that have two boy children may be selecting in favor of girls. And this is where um, we had drawn the conclusion that, again, we're talking about hundreds of people in the United States um, could be selecting to balance their families. They want a boy and a girl. And one pl that's one plausible interpretation, but that's not the in interpretation a son preference narrative that prevails in the United States makes of this data. And these results, we, um, I also had a survey done by the Cornell Survey Institute, and they also confirmed that beyond any other group, it's Asian Americans that want their family composition to be a boy and a girl. So what's interesting in itself is to uncover how misrepresentations of the data fueled by stereotypes sparked legislatures across the country to consider prohibitions um, and, you know, on sex-selective abortion. But some might think, well, who cares, right? Um, what is the problem with this legislation anyway? Morally, few people support the practice, and this goes to Professor Kolb's question as well. Um, you know, I say that I don't. Why don't I? And you're right, I don't really examine that question in detail in the book. I know it's some of the interesting work you um, have done uh, about looking at whether the morality uh, is contingent on sort of the sentient, uh, 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 when, when the fetus becomes sentient or not, and that is a distinguishing factor. Again, I don't necessarily um, engage in that. I just, you know, have just generally, uh, I think there, uh, I wouldn't recommend or morally suggest to anybody to, to abort somebody because, or abort at, and uh, have an abortion at all, let alone for this particular reason, right? Um, so, the laws are likely unenforceable anyway. The laws prohibit medical professionals from performing abortions if they're aware of the motives of the patient. Doctors may not ask the motives, and patients may lie. But I think there are at least three reasons to be concerned about the laws. First, the bans burden the rights of women who have other motives. So Arkansas became the latest state to pass a ban which um, was passed after the, the, the publication process uh, already started for the book, so it's not in the book. Uh, but doctors are now required to ask their patients whether or not she knows the predicted biological sex of the fetus. And if she says yes, then they must stop everything and obtain the prior records, um, medical records of the, of the woman, which causes further delays, right? It's just a delay tactic. And second, as um, Professor Katyal mentioned, there's profiling of Asian American women. I've heard in other migrant receiving countries, so these kinds of laws are being considered and passed in Canada, Australia, and the UK, um, that some clinics deny Asian American women information about their, um, the, the, the predicted sex of the fetus, and one woman said she just wanted to have a gender reveal party but couldn't get that information. Um, third, while I think the laws are unconstitutional in my, you know, my con law colleagues can uh, agree or, or disagree or get, I can get their feedback on that, I think if the question does ever reach the Supreme Court, um, it'll open the door to many restrictions that create categories of acceptable and unacceptable motives and will open the door to many more. Some states already prevent 
prohibit a woman from exercising her right to choose if the fetus has a genetic or other defect, right? And that's one of the reasons many people do obtain abortions. So distorted information about the scope of sex selection among immigrants, the reasons for sex selection, and the consequences pervade the American political discourse, which is what I uh, hope to show in the book. And this is because of the popular discourse, when we talk about immigrants, we fail to recognize that their behaviors and motives may change over time, and that they're not just based on culture, they'll contextual people respond to the context they're in, but the assumptions are often made that they're because of deep-seated cultural views rather than the product of, of context. So moving beyond stereotypes, uh, and decontextualized information, what I had proposed here is that I think an in-depth comparative study is necessary to properly assess what concerns immigrant women's practices pose for rights and equality. This means a quantitative and qualitative empirical, historical, political uh, study of the context where the practice emerged, why it's problematic there, and what makes it different in the country of destination. Um, it is for this reason that I study India as a way to better understand the legislation in this country. And as, um, you know, in, even within the India case study, uh, there are, uh, 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 the common perception is that there's daughter aversion, but what many Indian families want is actually at least one boy. And combined with technology and the desire to have fewer children, uh, we, hundreds of thousands of women each year have illegally learned the sex of their fetus and have aborted it. So Professor Shamir raised the problem of domestic <coughs> violence or other women's concerns, right? And she made a, 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 um, an interesting point, which is, well, can we just admit that um, some of these problems, like domestic violence, may be problematic everywhere? And domestic violence is an easy case, so I'll take that. Of course, feminists would not, um, it's not cross-national, and no one would support the practice, or everyone, most people think it's problematic. Um, but what I wanted to say here in, in, in this book, and maybe this is so sui generis to this particular practice, is that I wanted to, what I want, what I see sex selection is as, um, is, is potentially different in both contexts, potentially problematic in one and not from a feminist perspective in another. Um, some object, you know, to, before I expand on this point, let me just recognize the other ethical ob objections. I think this issue is so hard because there's so many layers of morality and ethics, and I want to unpack that and maybe leave that aside, right? Some object to others' decisions to sex select because it reinforces the gender binary and also the biological binary. Many European countries even prohibit pre-implantation sex selection. So in the United States, you can use IVF um, and implant only female or male embryos, or one can um, use sperm sorting to choose the, the, the to help select the, the sex of the child. And they object to that too. I have fewer moral objections to doing that. I think if people want to do that and create their families in the way they want, they should be able to do so. Um, and others object to sex selection because they object to abortion altogether. But if we can leave those aside and put those points to um, a different side, and then maybe then you, I think, are able, I hope, to see the distinctions of the two cases I'm talking about. The case of an Indian woman living in India that takes steps to have a boy after she has a girl, and the case of an, a woman of Indian descent living in the US um, that takes steps to have a boy after she has a girl. In both cases, if one believes in bodily autonomy and privacy, I, which I do, then, it, um, then we should allow women to exercise these rights even if they may seem problematic. However, however, as I point out, the first scenario raises different societal concerns and it's caused by different societal and contextual issues um, in India like patri uh, patrilocal forms of marriage which don't exist here. And I can see the um, point that Professor Shamir makes is that when in conducting this kind of comparative analysis, there might be a tendency for it to seem that what I'm, vast, what I'm doing is reifying and valorizing the culture of the global north or the migrant receiving country, which is what I say, which is the terminology I use, but I'm not doing that. I'm not trying to do that. I, I, I hope that it doesn't come off as that. I'm simply saying it's we don't have that women's rights problem. We have many different ones in the migrant receiving countries, certainly the United States. 
So in examining political discourse, the, 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 the very standard feminist perspective, you know, Rebecca Cook is this very reproductive rights scholar, examined this in Canada, and she thought these two cases are different, right? When she looked at Canadian immigrants, um, Indian American, Indian Canadian immigrants, and but she had immediately concluded the legal solution in both countries is not to adopt legal prohibitions. On the other hand, I believe that the actions of the women in India raise different concerns for women's equality because it contributes to per perpetuating harm to women and girls that are living in society and the empirical evidence as some people have s mentioned already is suggesting that, that a male surplus leads to increased sexual harassment, increased rape, increased child marriage. Um, and this sort of leads to the question that, that, that Professor Shamir also raised as well. If there are all these horrible things happening in India, and I've been able to cite two studies that have shown this, and also, by the way, which is accurate, dowry rates do have decreased in some areas, right? When there's a shortage of women, people will have to pay less to get their, their daughters married. So one of, the con one of the important questions she raises is, well, why um, do I stop and not evaluate? Why do I simply present an open and flexible contextualized framework but not apply it to the situation uh, in India and, and, and uh, you know, come to the conclusion one way or the other, right? The Indian feminists very strongly support a ban on, um, on information about, revealing information about the sex of the fetus. They strongly supported it, they created it, um, and there's no really strong conversation to stop it, even though people know that um, sometimes women die from illegally obtaining sex selection abortions, sometimes it burdens abortion altogether, um, and yes, people may have coercion, but so, the reason I didn't really necessarily want to come to a conclusion, I just wanted, I want to just create a new conversation um, and discussion about this uh, in India is I don't really, I, I, for me it's important to have an in-depth collaboration with local partners in order to do this. And quite frankly, the empirical data isn't been developed because people haven't, looking, haven't been looking at it from a consequences perspective. They have been looking at it simply from a perspective of uh, there's, this is discrimination, it's discrimination against the fetus, it's discrimination in society, and therefore we should stop it. And I'm uh, actually having a, a, a discussion in December uh, where, with Indian feminists, where I hope to uh, reframe the conversations to think about uh, a, a, a more consequences-based framework, which then could still open up the possibility of saying, well, look, at this point in time, um, yes, there's really uh, quite symbol important symbolic reasons for them to have the ban, because then they can tell people it's illegal, don't do this, it's wrong, don't discriminate. Um, and without a law, those symbolic values are, are, are taken away. So that's one consideration, um, which is should be part of a larger conversation with local actors with um, more empirical knowledge and evidence and solutions that look at consequences rather than solutions that simply look at um, prohibitions. Um, so with that, I don't, uh, I think I was just going to end it there and open it up to questions of people. That's great. Okay. So, um, thank you to all four of the speakers for a really fascinating set of comments. Um, so uh, now we're going to do uh, uh, questions. Uh, I'll take, I guess, the moderator's prerogative and maybe ask the, sure. the first question. Um, and then we'll, we'll go to the audience. Um, so th this is actually something that uh, Sunya and I were just kind of reflecting on. And, uh, I was wondering if you could talk a little bit about how the book fits into conversations about the contemporary immigration climate. Um, I was really struck by how when I f read some of the earliest um, chapters in draft, um, my way of thinking about it, and you know, this is before in a sense the rise of Trump was, well, this is just like really smart strategic political action by anti-abortion activists. In other words, anti-abortion activists have a specific kind of you know, set of objectives, and they're using um, tropes and stereotypes about non-Western peoples and traditions as a way to confuse and divide uh, liberal feminists. Um, so that, that felt to me like, well, that's the thing that's going on. And then reading um, the book again now in the context of what's happened over the last year, I was like, well, it's interesting, there's this other thing that was also there in the background that I wasn't quite aware of, which is 
So we have a president that's backing legislation that wants to cut legal immigration in half with the explicit policy objective of demographically transforming the country. In other words, very consciously limiting immigrants coming into this country from, from Asia, specifically India and China. You have an attorney general that on the radio has said that he backs the national origin quota from 1924, one of the most infamous pieces of modern American immigration legislation that eliminated entirely immigration from Asia and Africa to demographically purify in racial terms the country. And thinking about these laws over the last decade in the context of contemporary immigration practices, it almost felt like, well, maybe what was going on here is was part of a rolling implicit conversation about perhaps the, the unassimilability of Asian peoples. Um, and so I was just wondering if you could talk a little bit about the relationship between the two. What does the sex selection conversation tell us about the emergence of a real political base committed to transforming the demographics in the country and the broader conversation about the extent to which Asian people can actually be assimilated at all? Um, great uh, conversation. So one of my concerns in this political climate was that, well, he, again, more to the point of, of does this really matter? We're in a situation where, you know, we may not have the right to choose at all, let alone in this particular scenario. The House, as some of us know, passed this 20-week ban. You know, our, our, this particular right hinges on, um, you know, the health and welfare of you know, one or two people, you know, in the Supreme Court in Washington, D.C. So, um, in a way, it's, it's, it seems less, uh, uh, the, 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 this particular issue seems less uh, uh, relevant, but it's more relevant in other ways, which is it, it highlights the, um, the, the, the attack on immigrants rather than just the attack on uh, reproductive rights. And what I find interesting about our American conversation is that often when we talk about immigrants, right, and think about immigrants, it's Im immigrants from Latin America. Rarely, even though actually Asian Americans are the largest growing group of immigrants than even um, Latinos are, this is before Trump, um, we don't acknowledge that. And then when we do, there are about 17 million Asian Americans and we do think about Asian Americans, it's also thought about um, cat stereotypes of they're rich or that they're successful, um, but there are so many Asian Americans who communities that aren't and um, that are facing the similar struggles that, um, that other immigrant communities are facing. So I think, I hope that, that we need to complex, maybe complicate the narrative a little bit more about immigrants um, in this country. And then, you know, you have the other problem of some immigrants who actually, well, even Latinos and Asian Americans support, have this debate, are Latinos supporting Trump at that time? Were Latinos supporting Trump more or were Indian Americans supporting Trump more with my husband? And, you know, we both wanted to say <laughs> our, neither of our communities were support, that our communities less was supporting them, but there were both that were, okay? And so um, we, that, co that, that complicates you. And I think that, that um, but it does turn out this is a reproductive rights so I did some empirical studies about, well, are states where there's larger immigration of Asian Americans, are they more likely to adopt these bans, right? Because these laws in their preambles state this is because of missing Asian American women. They cite that 2008 law. They say that the electorate is missing Asian women. That's why we need to care about it. And so in this research with, um, uh, that I did, it turns out really the correlation uh, with what states adopted, it's more closely associated with whether they've, uh, they've considered prior restrictive legislation on abortion rather than the inflow um, of Asian immigration. Yeah. Let's go to the audience. Uh, and I apologize also if I, I don't know your name, so uh, maybe we'll start there. And do you mind just saying your name? I'm Daphne Hacker from Israel. I'm trying to think why the lab didn't manage to come with other examples of um, it's bad here, but it's so bad there. And I think maybe it's because you're comparing two different phenomena. Um, in India, it's femicide. And in the States, it's sex selection. And it's not the same. 
this year. Um, and any um, ref reflections on this? So, um, the, so uh, why don't you expand the thought about what um, pre-birth, yeah. what about the difference you see between infanticide and sex selection? Sex selection can be for, you know, we want a diverse family of females and males, and that's why we don't see statistically a difference between the outcome of this practice. Femicide is systematically uh, killing women, girls, or pre-birth females. Okay? What I'm, what I'm really asking, if that's the case, so maybe there is a limit to the theory of the different meaning of practices, and can we think of other practices? And, and I think your debate is, is, is a fascinating. Is that, can we really think that the, the, the practice of the debate is so different in different countries or due to immigration? Or is this really such a unique practice? Because it's, it, it's, it's called the same, but it's totally different. Right. So um, I guess I. You, Obviously, I agree that they're different phenomenon, but what I'm um, proposing is that that's not necessarily seen here in the political discourse, this nuance because of stereotypes, because of deconstruction. You know, we have media sound bites from India that shape our views rather than in depth. And similarly, on any immigrant issue about the veil, you know, we'll have pictures of people in different countries, you know, women in one room with you know, burqas on, and so where we think, well, it's bad if uh, 2,000 women wear it in France. Um, and I guess I would also take um, in, in a little bit of, uh, I would disagree a little bit with the, per, with the framing of this as femicide. Um, and I think that's one of the things I'm saying is sort of the, even the language, right? So gender side was used by first as a feminist um, theorist, Mary Warren had used the word gender side decades ago. And now that word is co-opted by the pro-life movement, and they've labeled what's happening as gender side in India. And I think it, femicide suggests it's a, a, a systematically, just genocide generally. I've, I've talked to Indian feminists who said, you should bring something to the ICC, you know, charging our pre prime minister with genocide, so uh, for sex selection. But it's right, it's individual actors making decisions in a context where there's a cultural tradition to have at least one son, where sons are economic supports, where daughters are not. That is, to me, not um, a systematic practice in the way, you know, the, the, the killing of women in Latin America by gangs, which is where the word femicide um, is more often used. So, um, I guess, I mean, even recharacterizing, I mean, maybe recharacterizing, rising it that way, I think is helpful. And I think it's also necessary and hard. I, I don't really, I have a hard time kind of extrapolating to different practices because because of what I'm saying is that it actually we need to do, I'm not assuming that I know a lot about the veil. I'm not assuming that I know a lot about feminine FGM or FCC without really an in-depth study of how it's being undertaken here. We had a case very recently of you know doctors going to jail for um, uh, performing uh, female genital cutting here. And again, I wanted to, uh, the same lens through which I looked at sex selection could be used, and the media was reporting it in the very same ways, right? Imagining the horrors in different countries. How is it being undertaken here? Is it sanitary? We, we don't know what it is here. Whether it's, you know, we of, of course just assume, right, certain cultural practices like um, circumcision is not problematic. So, but I want to understand it better before I can comment on it. And similarly, the veil is just the chapter that I'm exploring and I'm saying in France or in Belgium, it's assertion of minority rights, of community, of religion in a way, or here in the United States, in a way that it isn't, or in a, in a, it, that adds another layer of understanding it um, in those contexts. So, uh, so this is very interesting from Swap also because I had a couple of questions. Um, so one was on the issue of historical change, the fact that all of these contexts, all of these norms actually shift over time. And I'm just a little bit curious about how you think we deal with that, um, that change over time, and also the, kind of the, change, the fact that there have been changes up to where we are now. Um, but in particular, is there a way to know or to understand when right. something that has been historically appropriate in right. a particular context yeah. of a particular culture, whether that stops being appropriate? Out of 
Or do you think that given the pathogens of something like sex selective abortion um, in India, the abandoning of that practice or an attempt to ban that practice is going to be perfectly working because of the pathogens? I mean, it's very hard to look at going forward, but if you could do a counterfactual, a counterfactual in the U.S. thinking backward, would it have been possible or appropriate at any point in the U.S. to ban the practice, even though you don't think that's the case now, given the U.S. is on problem that history with gender discrimination. Um, so that's sort of one question, which is probably unanswerable, but I thought I'd ask you anyway, if you could answer it for me. Um, and then my second question was thinking also about kind of context and culture and how micro you can get in the analysis. I uh, follow a little bit on some of uh, Philip, uh, Philip's comments. Um, in particular, because there is this, which I'm sure you talk about in the book, there is this kind of idea that there's sometimes when practice, when, when people move to different cultures, there's a retrenchment of the culture, in particular in response to the majority culture. And so even though you think, oh, we're now in the global north where things are freer, so we don't actually have to worry so much about the oppression of these women in this majority, in this culture, that there's a, at least a narrative that it's actually the opposite that's the case, right? Um, and so I'm just wondering, at what point do you do the analysis? Or is that an appropriate analysis to do all the way down and, how far down do you go in thinking about this, particularly given that legislation has to exist on that historical level? Right. Um, so, uh, really interesting, challenging questions, and I do think um, you're right that 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 a analysis at each moments in several moments in time should be made and potentially different solutions are um, exist at those moments in time and and I guess so that I'm sort of unpacking the the, the, the you know the, the, the knee jerk tendency to just say universally uh, this is wrong and we should ban this um, let's take a contextualized analysis in the 80s the feminists who are writing about sex selection there's interesting writing there all of them were worried that, you know, um, and this was all around IVF technology being introduced. There was lots of concern that uh, women will be eliminated. There, there was predictions that the sex ratio would be horribly distorted, that we're talking about the elimination of, of women. So maybe at that moment in time, if, 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 if they were acting on their fears, but nothing happened and the data has shown that, well, actually the Caucasian Americans, to the extent they are sex selecting, it's it's for both sexes, to the extent Asian Americans are, some of them um, may be sun biased. So I don't know, I do think it's hard to do, and that's one of the things with doing this kind of empirical analysis. Do we do it on the basis of what we think might happen or what is actually happening, and then continually reevaluating? One of the literature I draw on is theories of sex ratio. There was a very sociological and really complex theories um, about the impact of male surpluses. And I say one can try to look at those theories and in the context in which they played out to try to predict what the impact might be um, um, on it. And then your um, other question is how fine-grained you look, right? So, I mean, I do say in there that I'm sure, right? So. Immigrants don't bring the context with them, but they bring their cultural baggage with them. So they're, one can't say that this person is doing it because they really want one son, because they learned in their culture that that's something important. Um, surely that is there, and surely that happens. But surely, as I was saying, that that behavior of having one son is motivated, motivated by the societal context, which is removed and dissipates here. And so it changes. So I wouldn't want to, to address the behavior of, you know, a small number of people to have legislation that has these dramatic negative consequences, right? So the interesting thing about this with women's equality um, issues and these issues, these prohibitions is that they are um, implicating two rights. So the veiling implicates the right to religion and the right, you know, to what other people perceive to be equality. And so does sex selection. So in, given that there implicates these multiple rights, we should be cautious um, on, on prohibiting them. Here. Um, I was struck a little by your inability to come up with examples of a practice that would be uh, impermissible, sorry, permissible in the country of origin, but 
distinguish your prey from something different. So here are a few. So childlike uh, there are uh, areas in the developing world where there aren't great educational opportunities uh, for children, and so you might want to allow child labor, but you wouldn't in a developed country. Uh, along the similar lines for adults, uh, certain there's an argument about sex work, right? That it, that uh, campaigns by Westerners to um, you know end sex workers, you know, to to uh, uh, abolish prostitution in parts of the developing world actually are not in the interests of the So, um, and, and this it does sort of, one, it goes to one of Hila's points, which is, well, let's just look at, do the analysis for different countries differently. Maybe it has nothing to do with universalism. Um, and, you know, I, I, I think though it's still, uh, and just let me start by defending universalism for a minute. Of course, I'm a human rights advocate. I do believe that it's important to have a set of rights that, a set of commitments, a set of uh, baseline, you know, obligations that we think every person has and, and, and should have. Um, but I agree that one should, and I think that the, the, the child labor example, actually we had a paper with, from Daphna with exactly this point yesterday saying, you know, we should have it, uh, why not have developing countries um, allow their children to work, that might be better off if you look at the children and their survival um, uh, than, and, and, and project this Western concept. I, I'm absolutely sympathetic to that. I think we should be open to conducting that country level analysis um, in each specific circumstance rather than a general prohibition or a, or, or a lack of it. And that's maybe the distangling, you know, of, but, but, but rather than saying, well, you know what, for India it's okay for 12 year old boys to work. Uh, because that's what they do there, and you know they don't have any opportunities anyway, and so it's their culture. So that's different than saying, well, it might actually be a, a strategy that's needed at this moment in time for them not to be stunted and to survive and grow, and then with the idea that, well, you know, we should eventually, they should, everyone should have education and opportunities to succeed. So it, in a way, it's both what you're saying, applying that kind of analysis, consequential husband, in, in, a, in, a, in a context basis content country level basis. So I think we've come to the end of our time. I'd like to thank uh, Chitil again for being the reason for us all to, to be here today and our wonderful panelists for their terrific comments. I, thank you. Thank you all. Thanks so much for being here. I really appreciate everything and all you guys being here. It's so special and important. Thank you.